applied life sciences. Um, and today we're going to hear a very lovely presentation from James. So I will keep my portion very short, but I did wanna give a very broad overview of our facility and what ICTC offers. Um, so as many of you may already know or not know, we are a fairly new facility, um, largely brought up during the COVID-19 pandemic to provide affordable high throughput qPCR testing for COVID-19. Um, so in 2020 and 2021, that was our main focus. And at the very peak of the pandemic, we were testing upwards of 20,000 samples per week. Um, also in collaboration with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, providing immunology assay uh, running to assess the immunity to COVID-19. So present day, what that has left us with is a laboratory space that is CLIA approved, as well as a, um, a workforce of trained staff, clinically and research-based methods. Um, we also have a strong team of scientific advisors, consultants um, that can assist with a multitude of projects. So both your clinical and research assay needs, we are here to help. Just to name a few, uh, we have equipment and expertise in nucleic acid extraction for high throughput methods, as well as high throughput qPCR and both molecular and immunological assay development. Okay, so a lot of the equipment we offer is listed here. Um, really, our the bulk of our equipment comes in our Hamilton liquid handling robot. So we actually have six of these. Um, and the interesting thing about the Hamiltons is they're fully customizable, both on the deck layout, um, as you can see a sample here, there's different modules that you can purchase um, and implement with these robots. They're also fully programmable. Um, we have a contract with Hamilton as well that assists with the programming for different methodologies, different assays, um, really any liquid handling project, uh, these can handle to, to minimize the, um, human error or just minimize the pipetting needed. So that is sort of on the pre-analysis end um, and the liquid handling end. As far as actual sample analysis and data output, we have a suite of real-time PCR systems. Um, we have four BioRad CFX384 analyzers. So each of these, as you can imagine, holds a 384 well plate. So multiply that by four and you have high throughput capacity for qPCR testing. Um, for more smaller scale projects, we do have an Applied Biosystems Quant Studio 7, um, also a qPCR analyzer. This interestingly also has the capability and the software for SNP genotyping, if that is of need for your project. Um, so also moving away from qPCR, we do have a microplate read reader, and this multimode reader can measure absorbance fluorescence as well as luminescence. Um, and for more, again, high throughput capacity, we have a plate stacking module. Um, and this allows you to analyze and load multiple plates at a time. So alongside our suite of equipment, um, we do provide technical services. So really from the stage of providing us with your sample all the way through data output, um, we're there to help you. So we have, like I said, a team of clinically and research trained staff to support your assay needs. Um, and if you're looking at more of the clinical end of things, we do provide validation and feasibility testing. Um, if you're looking at either some pre-market surveys for FDA or just clinical sample analysis. So if you're interested in working with us or just wanna learn more about our what we offer, um, just chat about your project, please reach out to us. Um, we're located on the fifth floor, so come stop by, chat with us, happy to help. All right, before I hand off to James, I did just want to give a, a broad overview of sort of the methods we use in ICTC to analyze samples. Um, so James came to us in late 2022, said he had about well, more than a thousand samples, um, DNA samples that he needed to analyze and asked if that was something ICTC could do. Um, in short, we said, yes, absolutely. And so it's something that I think would have taken James and probably some students as well an entire summer, we were able to analyze in less than a week. Um, so once we received all of the necessary reagents and, um, and analytic uh, 
programming, we were able to take the thousand plus samples from James, load them onto our Ham Hamilton robots, transform that into a more high throughput um, capacity. So move the samples into a 384 well plate format. And also these Hamiltons are able to add our PCR reagents. So all in one go, add your sample PCR reagents to each individual well, also track each individual sample's location. So taking out all of those manual steps, um, Hamilton completes that for us. It spits out 384 well plate that's immediately loaded onto our BioRad analyzers. And in approximately two hours, we saw these beautiful PCR amplification curves um, shown in the image here. And so along with our amplification curves, we also um, had resulting cycle threshold values. Uh, and as a precursor to running these samples, ICTC also, sorry, ICTC also um, was able to perform standard curve analyses um, to normalize the data and transform those CT values or cycle threshold values into a more interpretable gene, estimated gene copy number. So with that, I'm going to hand off to James who will give you more detail on his project. If I can advance the slide, there we go. <laughs> All right, well, um, thank you for that context. And um, Ashley is being very modest. Um, they saved me probably a year's worth of work, <laughs> more than more than the summer. It would have taken me much longer than that to, to do all those samples myself. Um, so, so yeah, um, I'm gonna give you uh, kind of a twofold talk today. Um, the first half is context about migratory or diadromous species of fish, since I figure this probably isn't a very fish heavy audience. Um, and then the second half is going to be more about the technical aspects of the project that we worked on together. Um, so with that, um, these are four of the migratory species, species of fish that uh, we'll be talking about. But first, we're going to start with some background. Um, so what is a migratory or diadromous species of fish? Um, the prefix uh, di obviously means two. And so we have two more confusing terms, anadromous and catadromous, um, that diadromous is an umbrella term for. And to, to put it simply, uh, we'll start with anadromous. Uh, it means that the fish spend 90% of their lives in the ocean, hopefully that's coming through, where they, where they live, they grow, they feed. Um, and then when an environmental cue, usually around springtime comes around, they start migrating upstream uh, into estuaries and large river drainages, also small river drainages. This is the Connecticut River. Um, and these are a school of American shad swimming upstream in the Connecticut River that I was able to catch with my drone. Um, also, if uh, you couldn't tell, I really like taking pictures of fish. You're gonna be getting a lot of fish pictures in this talk. Um, and once they make it into these freshwater um, drainages, they make their way to uh, smaller tributaries and streams. And these are some American eels swimming upstream uh, and a, a very small creek on the, the Cape. Um, they make their way up these streams and they often come into contact with things like human induced um, barriers like fish ladders um, and dams. This is a fish ladder on the uh, southeastern part of New England in Kingston, Massachusetts. And a fish ladder is simply a, a device that people make in order to help fish get upstream of human impediments like dams. Um, so they make their way up the tributaries, through the dams, up to headwater lakes where they can either complete or take part in a part of their life cycle. Um, many diadromous species of fish um, are what are, is known as iteroparous, which is a fancy word to say that they can spawn more than once in their life. Salmon is the classic example of a semilparous species, meaning they swim upstream, spawn, and die. Um, most of the species that we have in the New England area are um, iteroparous. So they swim upstream, spawn in freshwater lakes, spawn in freshwater lakes, and um, swim back outstream to, to continue their life cycle. Um, these are some river herring um, swimming in a, a headwater pond, uh, also in Kingston, Massachusetts, uh, hanging out in all that nice veg vegetation where they where they lay their eggs. In um, uh oh, here we go. 
sorry. Uh, in Massachusetts, or also in New England, we have uh, 11 species of anadromous fish, so ocean to freshwater, and one species of catadromous fish, so freshwater to the ocean. Um, and those fish are alewife, American eel, this is the one catadromous species, so they spend most of their life in um, headwater ponds. They can live up to about 20 years before they swim out to sea to spawn in the Sargasto Sea. Very cool animal if you ever wanna look them up. Uh, American shad, um, this American shad picture also has a little bonus. It has a little sea lamprey attached to it and we'll get to the lamprey. Uh, Atlantic salmon, don't have a picture of them. Atlantic sturgeon, Atlantic tomcod, blueback herring, and blueback and alewife are commonly um, joined together in an umbrella term called river herring because they're very similar both behaviorally and genetically. Brook trout, rainbow smelt, sea lamprey. Sarah in on that slide, <laughs> um, which is, it's always a fun picture to, to have that up. Um, uh oh, what happened? Short-nosed sturgeon and striped bass. Uh, but for the purposes of today, we're gonna to be focusing on the river herring, the alewife and blueback herring, American shad and rainbow smelt. So why do diadromous fish matter? Um, uh, on the map to my right, your left uh, is the, the Native American or tribal nation um, historical map. Um, we are on native land. And the, the tribal nations have for, since time immemorial, been, uh, had a connection to migratory species of fish. As the, the fish runs start in early spring, it would bring protein into the system and help sustain um, uh, tribal nations. Um, there's a spiritual, cultural, and physical connection with these fish. Um, and also, uh, we wouldn't be here today or America would be a very different landscape today if it weren't for migratory species of fish. Um, the colonial, uh, colonial Americans relied on uh, migratory species of fish for many of the same reasons. They were critically important for um, protein um, in, uh, after harsh New England winters and uh, economically. Um, they also were used for fertilizer um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just incredibly important, um, both culturally and historically. Um, they have a, a monumental uh, ecological role in that they are a keystone species. And if you are unfamiliar with that term, keystone species essentially means uh, a species that uh, is a part of an ecosystem. And without that species in that ecosystem, that ecosystem would then fall apart or not be the same. And migratory or diadromous species of fish are um, critically important because they're keystone species in not just one, but three different habitats. Um, the example here is uh, a salmon, uh, Pacific salmon specifically, and um, they, they support three different habitats at different parts of their life cycle and different parts of other ecosystems life cycles. Um, they also provide uh, critical ecosystem services. Um, so regulating services like control of prey populations, supporting services uh, like forage for predators and nutrient exchange within an environment. They bring saltwater nutrients into inland uh, freshwater systems that are nutrient starved. Um, cultural services like recreation, spiritual, economic, aesthetic, and restor restorative purposes and provisioning services. Um, they provide food, bait, and fertilizer that help us do what we need to do. Uh, to, to go about our lives. Um, they are economically important. This is a chart showing the, the landings of just river herring. Um, and as you can see in the early 1970s, late 1960s, the populations of, or the, the catches of uh, river herring in metric tons um, crashed. And it's because the populations of river herring crashed around that time. Um, and they really haven't recovered since. Um, in, in the early 90s, there was a moratorium placed on river herring, but not all species of migratory fish um, have that moratorium. Um, there are both commercial and recreational fisheries for many, if not all, of the 
um, migratory species that we've been talking about today. Uh, which kind of brings us to the threats to migratory fishes, which is the, the same thing. Um, commercial fishing uh, landings uh, are a huge threat to migratory fish, uh, overfishing and um, fisheries resource management is a critically important part of maintaining these populations of fish. And it's something we're still working on figuring out how to do effectively. Um, another huge threat to migratory species of fish um, are dams. Um, our uh, colonial history, uh, the, the, um, the economy of New England was based around mill power uh, for a large part of, of the early years of settlement. Um, and with mill power, you needed to put a dam on any large, medium, or small river, creek, or stream. And those dams, many of them are still here today. Everywhere you see a red dot on this map, or any dot on this map, is a dam that is likely still intact. Um, dam removal is becoming a more and more prevalent uh, phenomenon that removing these dams is incredibly expensive and uh, also incredibly difficult to do. And um, these dams cut off connectivity from freshwater ecosystems to the ocean. I like to think of the rivers in all over the world as our like cardiovascular system. They are the veins, the arteries, uh, of the planet. And without that connectivity, well, you, you kind of know what happens when you lose connectivity to, <laughs> uh, between you know, parts of your body. Not good. Um, so that brings us to how we manage these fisheries. And fisheries are often managed in a multifaceted way between many different partners, including governments, uh, state and federal, fishery stakeholders, uh, coastal stakeholders, nonprofits, scientists, and commercial fisheries. Um, and a, a group that is not listed here uh, are, are tribal nations. And any kind of co-management decision-making should be uh, including tribal nations at the table as tribal nations have their own relationships with these migratory species of fish, um, often subsistence fisheries, and um, have been maintaining these uh, practices for quite a long time, uh, much longer than, than we have. Um, I know this is a busy figure, um, but this is all to say that um, in order to get to any decision-making or outcome in management, you need to have good data. Without good data, you cannot make informed decisions. And without informed decisions, you can't implement things like effective restoration actions. Um, in the state of Massachusetts, this is just a list of some of the partners that I work with, um, including the town of Plymouth, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Massachusetts Division of Fish Fisheries and Wildlife, the North and South River Watershed Association, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, the main project partner for this um, uh, effort that I'm going to be talking about, the Wampanoag Tribe of Great Herring Pond, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. There are many others, but these are the ones that I work with specifically. Um, and before we were coming back, or we're getting close to being done with the, the background information, um, but I want to give you some context about how this project came to be. So for uh, about a year and a half, I worked as a biological fisheries technician for the, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. And the Mass DMF um, are the ones who are in charge of monitoring our coastal populations of migratory species of fish. So every year, they go out into the rivers and streams in the springtime when these fish are swimming upstream to spawn. They capture them, they count them, and they measure them to see how healthy uh, these populations of fish are. And it was this relationship that I started with the Diadromus Fisheries team at the DMF that eventually led to this project being possible in the first place. I'm very grateful to them. Um, and the Division of Marine Fisheries uses many monitoring techniques, um, three of which uh, we'll be talking about today. And those are electronic river herring counts. Whenever you have a pinch point in a river in between the ocean and the headwaters, you can put in a large metal box that has a bunch of tubes. And every time a fish swims through that tube, it disrupts an electrical signal. Every time that signal gets disrupted, it adds a one. So you get a really good census of the number of fish coming in and going out of that system using uh, an electronic river herring count counter. Electrofishing surveys, these are the most fun, I think. Um, you get to put on a pair of waders and throw on a backpack and walk around a river or a stream like you're a ghostbuster. 
um, and you are uh, emitting an electrical current into the water that stuns fish and makes them incredibly easy to catch. Um, good for us, not so great for the fish. Electrofishing can be harmful to fish, not always, but it can um, harm them. Um, and so it is not uh, one of my favorite techniques, but it is, it is fun to do. And then finally, we have fike net surveys. Um, fike nets are large winged nets that you put in the tidal reach of, of an estuary um, in the middle of the stream. Um, and it, those wings channel the fish into a central column that then um, traps the fish for biologists to come by and um, count and measure later. Um, also, uh, fike nets can be rather damaging. Uh, I've seen cormorants get into those fike nets, eat the best and last meal of their lives. The tide comes up, all the fish and the bird is dead. So it also can be a little harmful. Uh, some drawbacks to some of these traditional monitoring techniques. They're labor and time intensive. They're expensive to implement. They're potentially harmful to the monitoring targets. And they're spatially limited. You're doing these things in one time in one place. Um, well, mostly one place. You can do them through time. Which brings us to modern monitoring. And I challenge anyone to say that five times fast. I struggled with it practicing many times. <laughs> um, that picture uh, is me and some of my undergraduate researchers um, collecting water in Kingston, Massachusetts. And the other picture is, I think, the quintessential picture of, of how you would describe environmental DNA. Which brings us to what is environmental DNA? Environmental DNA is essentially and simply um, DNA sourced from an environment instead of from an organism themselves. And once you have that environmental sample, you can isolate, amplify, extract, and identify um, different species from that environmental sample without ever having to come into contact, see, or know that that species is technically there. Um, there are two main approaches. There are more, but the, the two main ones that are mostly used are single species approaches using qPCR, which is what we're going to be talking about for this project and what Ashley mentioned earlier, and uh, metabarcoding or biodiversity approaches, which allows you to get a sense of, of, of community or biodiversity at a given time and place. Um, that spreadsheet is just like one tenth of the number of species I've detected in just two sites. Um, and everywhere you see a little green cell means we got a positive detection there. And if they're on that list, it means that they were detected at least once. Um, so it's DNA sourced from environmental samples rather than directly from an organism. And environmental DNA can inform you about three main things in environment at a given time and place. Species presence, biodiversity, and what we're gonna be talking about today, which is species abundance estimates. Now using environmental DNA for species abundance um, can get a little bit complicated. So with any technique, you have sources of bias. Environmental DNA has some very particular sources of bias and those include um, false positives. So you can um, have, my favorite example of a false positive is uh, in the Headwater Lake at, in Kingston, Massachusetts at the Jones River. Um, I got a detection for bluefin tuna. I know I have never, and there has never been bluefin tuna in that lake. Um, my hypothesis is that somebody's septic system leaked. And since DNA is such a hardy molecule, it stayed intact long enough for us to detect using environmental DNA. You can also get amplified signals for concentration. This picture over here is a dead um, sea lamprey. And as that organism uh, decays, it's going to emit a huge amount of DNA into the environment that can falsely um, exaggerate your concentrations that you could get. Um, that other picture uh, that looks kind of like a starry night is a river herring that had a really bad day. Um, uh, I think an otter found it and uh, eviscerated it and left its scales all over the riverbed um, for me to find later. And this is also a potential source of error when you're doing environmental DNA sampling. Um, you can also get false negatives um, if you're looking for a particularly rare species that uh, isn't um, uh, super prevalent and you're not sampling thoroughly enough, you might miss that species. Or if that species, like a green crab or something like that, doesn't emit a lot of DNA, um, you could also miss it. All right, so that's all the background. 
Thanks for sticking with me. I know this isn't a, a fishy crowd. Um, and now we're getting to the actual project itself. Uh, so the research goal uh, is to determine if environmental DNA can be utilized in concert with current and future monitoring programs for optimized management outcomes. What is an optimized management outcome? It's determining who and what and how many is where at a given time and place, and then being able to take that information and make decisions um, to better manage or restore populations of fish that we're interested in. My research question is what is the relationship between environmental DNA, GCE scores, which we'll get to, um, and abundance metrics collected seasonally over five months by the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries for electronic hair encounters, electrofishing surveys, and fike net surveys. And a GCE score is just a genome copy equivalent. It's an established number of copies of a specific gene target in the original water samples. It's the value that we'll be using throughout this, the rest of this presentation to talk about and what we use to calibrate environmental DNA scores to traditional abundance numbers. So my, my sampling design was informed um, pretty heavily by a meta-analysis done by Yates et al where they looked at several dozen papers um, uh, calibrating environmental DNA to um, different abundance metrics. And what they found was that in natural systems, uh, your R squared or, and correlation coefficients is much lower than it is in laboratory settings, which makes a lot of sense. But I do wanna cue you into um, their R squared for natural systems. It is just around 0.6. Um, and this is important for later. And the, the Yates et al. crew had several recommendations for any um, environmental DNA calibration project moving forward that they should include. And those included streamlining and standardizing your methodologies, accounting for environmental variables and system specific types and structures. That basically just means that every uh, riverine or wetland or lake or ocean ecosystem is unique and you have to consider its unique properties in order to inform your sampling design. Um, refining predictive models, which is what we are working on currently. Um, broad replicating sampling efforts across large spatial and temporal scales. That's why I had uh, more than a thousand samples uh, that Ashley and the ICTC team were able to help me with. Uh, generating high quality abundance metrics, shifting focus away from catch per unit effort and biomass and incorporating absolute abundance. And that is what the DMF did with their electronic herring counts. Um, and so now we're gonna get into the methods. I, this is a little bit busy, but this is the fastest and easiest way I could figure out how to uh, describe the sampling design for most of our sites. Each little um, picture in the middle is a different monitoring type, electronic herring count, bike net survey and electrofishing surveys. And um, importantly, DNA is known to travel linearly in, in um, flowing systems. So it doesn't plume or spread very easily. Um, and so we wanted to see if there was habitat preferences um, being made by the, the organisms that we were trying to study. So we sampled both upstream and downstream of every, uh, so we sampled upstream and downstream of every single traditional technique. And then we sampled across a stream transect to capture any specific or microhabitat use that they might be exhibiting. Um, this is a map of all of our locations throughout Massachusetts. Um, we had five river herring sites, two American shad sites, and four rainbow smelt sites. This calendar at the bottom is showing you the months of the year that these fish are in those systems to spawn. Like I said, most of these fish start in early spring, continue to spawn for a couple of months and then leave the systems entirely, which makes it a pretty adept system to detect these fish using environmental DNA because you know for most of the year, they're not there. All right, so the workflow of environmental DNA, uh, it starts with water sample collection. Uh, you then freeze or store that environmental sample or you filter it on site. You then extract and store that DNA in a negative 80 freezer. You guys all know this <laughs> procedure pretty well. Um, then you do your single species qPCR analysis on your samples. Thank you to the UMass ICTC team. And then you analyze your results. 
Um, the current preliminary analysis, I am working on more uh, in-depth models, but uh, the semester got away from me. Um, so right now we have a univariate linear model showing uh, the relationship between our eDNA GCD values and our DMF abundance metrics. Okay, so now the good stuff. Um, there's no significant difference between sampling points across stream transects. This surprised me a lot. I figured that there would be. Um, and uh, this, this was consistent across all of our sites and at the whole data set scale. However, environmental DNA GCE scores collected seasonally are highly correlated with river herring census data. Um, this uh, graph to, the, to my left and also your left um, is showing uh, with the blue bars, the mean eDNA GCE score and on the, the left y-axis and on the right y-axis in the green line is the number of herring counted per day. And as you can see, the environmental DNA um, GCE scores track the, the numbers of fish in these systems really, really well, um, far better than even I anticipated. And I want to call you back to that 0.6-ish um, R squared value that uh, the Yates et al. team found in their meta-analysis. And um, ours, I mean, I know it's kind of hard to see, um, was 0.88, which I was, was thrilled with. Um, so that's highly correlated, more so than I could have ever hoped for. Um, Environmental DNA GCE scores collected seasonally are highly correlated with electrofishing catch per unit effort data. Um, same, same deal on this graph. Blue lines are, blue bars are mean GCE scores and green line is um, the catch per unit effort. One thing I wanna call your attention to is that even after the um, electrofishing surveys stopped detecting uh, American shad, our eDNA panel was able to detect all the way until June, um, showing that the sensitivity of environmental DNA is even more so than being in a stream with the fish themselves and shocking, <laughs> which I think is also a cool result. Environmental DNA GCE scores collected seasonally are correlated, but not strongly with rainbow smelt fike catch per unit effort data. This is a little bit dicey because um, on that one detection, that one large detection, um, with the catch per unit effort, uh, the, the fight net only had one rainbow smelt in it. <laughs> However, um, on that day, we got the highest um, environmental DNA score that we got the entire season. And again, the environmental DNA is showing a higher sensitivity than um, fight net surveys uh, because we were getting hits both before and after that, that fish was detected. Some of the next steps for this data, it will be incorporating environmental variables and mechanistic variables. And when I say mechanistic variables, I mean things like environmental DNA shed rate, um, DNA decay rate in natural environments, and um, things like hydrodynamic models um, about how water behaves in different um, aquatic environments. All right, so what does all this mean? Well, Incorporating the Yates et al. 2019 recommendations significantly improves correlations in natural systems. Sampling across stream transects produced no significant difference in species detection for these three diadromous species. And eDNA GCE scores track daily, weekly, and seasonal species abundance and census data. And finally, eDNA methods add relevant context to ongoing monitoring programs. And one of my favorite and recent examples of this is uh, in the Indian Head River uh, electrofishing site. And I know it's not a great name. It's an old New England river. Um, however, uh, these two pins are where we were electrofishing um, uh, in the Indian Head River. The downstream site is where you start and where we collected our downstream environmental DNA sample. And we take our backpacks and walk all the way upstream to the upstream site. And the upstream site is located at this dam. Uh, and one of our project partners wanted to know if American shad were able to make it upstream of this dam via this fish, fish ladder that is right in the middle of that dam. Um, and so we sampled upstream of the dam as well as downstream to, to help answer that question. And it turns out there's no compelling evidence that American shad are making it upstream of that dam. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, this is super recent, 
um, the North and South River Watershed Association reached out to me and asked if they could use some of the data from this project to help bolster their case for this dam removal. Um, and they're going to be using this uh, in their grant applications and, in, and um, uh, to, to help get money and, and permitting uh, for this dam removal, which I was, which is the entire reason I started doing this in the first place. So super, super exciting result, um, I think. Um, environmental DNA will never be a one-to-one -one replacement for traditional monitoring techniques. They tell you different things. Um, environmental DNA is telling you the concentration of DNA in a unit volume of water, uh, and you can detect species presence. Uh, these other uh, diadromous species monitoring techniques are telling you things about the, the age structure, the sex, uh, the, the growth rates of these fish populations. They're, they're very important and different things. However, environmental DNA is a very easy way to amplify the power of any uh, ongoing monitoring program. You can easily sample at many locations and you can easily sample um, thoroughly and robustly through time uh, for a fraction of the cost of a traditional method. I've been advised to never say never by somebody in this audience. Um, however, in my view, it, it's unlikely, but not impossible. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is that without these traditional monitoring techniques, you can't get an estimate for abundance using environmental DNA. You need something to calibrate to. Um, however, our understanding of these relationships of environmental DNA within different environments is constantly being refined. And I, I'm, I bring this figure up to show you the kind of scale at which some of these lakes, ponds, and rivers are. Great Herring Pond is a massive freshwater lake uh, inland on the Cape. And um, our, our squared values were um, for this tiny little pond right there. I don't know if everybody can see it. And, but as soon as you dilute that si signal, in a huge pond like that, your correlations go down pretty significantly. Um, however, this is just showing you the three or four sites uh, at that location. And we still see the same patterns um, throughout the season at all of these locations, which is pretty exciting to me. The fact that we got that, that signal, that bumps, it can tell us relevant information like when the fish are getting there, when they're likely spawning and when they're leaving. Um, all without knowing the abundance of the fish in those systems. All right, so for my research question, what's the relationship between environmental DNA and abundance metrics collected by the DMF? We have some answers and we are getting more for electrofishing or electronic herring counts, electrofishing surveys and flight net surveys. And for our research goal to determine if eDNA can be utilized in concert with current and future monitoring programs, you know, I say, I say yes, I think it ought to be, and I think it could add a lot of relevant context and power to any ongoing monitoring program to help inform how best to manage these populations. Um, environmental DNA monitoring can add relevant ecological context, I've already said this. <laughs> uh, eDNA monitoring can provide managers real-time functional data to inform critical decisions being made. Um, the turnaround time on environmental DNA samples is uh, oftentimes, if you have the money, uh, much faster than it is for uh, traditional techniques. Um, and with careful and thorough sampling design, environmental DNA methods can successfully be used to detect species abundance and calibrated to an established methodology. And finally, I'll leave you with increasing uh, environmental DNA techniques can be more accessible than traditional monitoring techniques for any kind of agency, tribe, school group, state or government agency. Um, because they're increasingly affordable, they're consistently being refined, they have simple field sampling and are more cost-effective than many alternatives. Um, I would like to, to thank um, Dr. Michelle Stoudinger, Adrian Jordan and Jeremy Anderson, Dr. Jeremy Anderson right there, um, uh, who without their help, I would not have been able to do this. Um, my project partners at the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, I am forever grateful to them, um, to Peter and Ashley, they, without their help, like I said, I would still be doing my uh, QPCR work um, and, and many, many others. And with that, uh, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Can you take uh, examples at this point? Um, so I suppose I can just answer. Uh, do you take 
bunch of different samples and then merge, like pool them together? To that's a that's a great question. So the question for folks on Zoom, if you couldn't hear, was if you take, I guess, replicate samples um, at different points when you're collecting the water. And the answer is yes. We because it gets expensive fast, the more you do it. Um, we took duplicate samples, but there are some cases, I think, with another project that we're doing where we take triplicate samples to be extra sure um, and to, to make sure that the, the signal that we're getting is actually what we're what we're getting instead of some sort of you know one off, like you gotta, I don't know. Scale. Yeah, scale or something. Um, yeah. Uh, so traditionally, we the question was, what is the sample volume we need? And traditionally, uh, you can use anything from like 250 mils, which I've done before, to up to a liter. And I like to hang around a liter just, you know, to have more than less. Um, but uh, but yeah, I've had pretty great success just taking sample volumes of just 250 milliliters. The other question is, why, why do you think you don't see a difference? Absolutely. Uh, that question was, why do I think we don't see a difference across the river? And uh, I thought about that a lot. And I honestly think that, you know, most rivers um, uh, are dynamic. They, they bend, they move, they have um, complex uh, uh, riverbed morphology. And so that's instead of like in a lab setting, of course, the DNA flows in a plume, uh, a linear plume. But in a natural setting, I think it's probably dispersed more quickly. Yeah. Um, and eventually, like in that, that lab study, um, they found that, you know, after a certain number of dozens of yards or hundreds of yards, that it did begin to slowly diffuse, but not, not quickly. Yeah. Um, this reminds me a lot of the Oh, nice. But also, I was just wondering, can they do this in the oceans at all or just in river now? You can do it in the oceans. I think oceans are a little bit more complex because they are so um, <laughs> connected. Uh, and it's it's hard to, the nice thing about rivers and lakes is you know your signal is coming from a very confined location. In flowing systems, you know your signal is likely coming from somewhere upstream. In a lake, you know your signal is likely coming from somewhere in that lake. Um, in oceans, it, it gets a little bit more complicated and you would need a more targeted sampling design, I think, to come to similar conclusions, but I don't think it's impossible. But it is, it is difficult, I would say. Oh, we got one in the chat. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, well, I guess everybody can read it. Uh, research is already being used to inform management decisions. I'm curious if you have thought about any formal guidance for managers on how to interpret environmental DNA information. I think that's probably going to be one of my chapter dissertations. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of opinions on this, uh, and I think it could be misinterpreted really, really easily. Um, and I think um, being incredibly careful and meticulous about how you interpret your data and how you inform your sampling design is, um, I think, often more important than the results you get. Um, so, so to answer your question, yes. Uh, and if you, did you have something like more specific or Hopefully that answered your question. Um, I don't have anything like off the top of my head of like do X, Y, and Z to do it well, aside from uh, <laughs> do your homework and be careful. No. Oh, no. Is this technology being used by managers yet? Or is it just sort of like scientists or experimenting and so the question is if this is being used uh, by managers yet or if it's mostly being used by scientists it's starting to i know that after the, seeing the results from this um, effort the the dmf has expressed interest in adopting some of these techniques and i know that they are already adopting um, environmental dna for another system um, and i think it's it's not being adopted wholesale yet there's a lot of um, controversy with environmental DNA, understandably. And, um, but I, I do think that it's getting picked up more and more rapidly. And that's the whole reason that I'm, I started this PhD is to get 
to help get these tools into managers' hands that can use them in an, an informed way. Um, so not yet, but it, it's getting there, but it's mostly used by academics at this point. Yeah. I'd like to, I don't, but I would want to have a much larger budget and have other people to do that for me. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I would, I would think that this is something that like uh, a management agency like the Division of Marine Fisheries could easily implement and maybe send samples to the ICTC uh, core facility or something like that. Um, and I think that that would be the, the next step in that process. However, that's a lot for, for just me to do. Yeah, you just what I think is a great study is how you have gone through some continuous look at the recommendations you gave and said, okay, how can we effectively like where in this can we do this? I could just see people at like uh EMF being really excited to be like, okay, well this is the growth gap for twenty twenty two and these are the conditions we have to include. How do they compare from the twenty three survey that could be year to year, like they could just have one curve. That would be really cool. And I mean, the good news is many of the, um, not all my projects are done. And I've been sampling in several of the, the drainages that we looked at for this project um, starting in 2019. So for some of those sites, we'll have replicate samples through years, um, but not in the same, not with the same sampling design, but we'll have something to compare to at least. Yeah. Why is it so hard to remove dams? You can't just like knock them over. I mean, uh, <laughs> you can. Um, you get you get arrested pretty quick if you do that, though. Um, but if they're like old, you know, not in use, colonial era, don't you know? I don't know. Yeah, it's just uh, th there's a whole lot of permitting um, and a whole lot of money and a whole lot of engineering that goes into dam removals since they are supporting such a huge amount of water behind them oftentimes that like it requires a lot of um, care and money and effort to, to remove them for, for context. In another past life, I was working at a nonprofit that's focused solely on dam removals mm -hmm. and uh, a small main stem dam in the Jones River in Southeastern Massachusetts cost $2.5 million to remove. Wow. And that took over a decade to do because you had to do one of the, one of the aspects of dam removal is monitoring. You have to be able to dictate and say who and what is there that you need to remove this dam for. And usually you have to hire uh, like a $100,000 contractor to come out. But with, with something like this, you might be able to do it for a couple thousand. Um, and then there's a whole lot of other steps along the way where um, you, know, you have to hire an engineering firm. The engineering firm has to have designs approved. You have to have those designs approved by state agencies and federal agencies then you have to actually do the work. And so it, it takes a long time to just get one dam removed. Time, effort, and money. I wish you could just go kick them over. Right. <laughs> no problem. Oh, political will. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important one. Cool. Oh, thank you. And thanks everybody on Zoom. I appreciate everybody coming.